everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching Chasing History, brought to you by Arrowheads.com and Smoky Mountain Rail Group. And we're here once again with our buddy, Art Gerber, to talk about the history of the cultures behind one of the most famous archaeological sites, the Crib Mound. Art, man, dude, I cannot thank oh, you. Oh, dude, it's my no. pleasure always seeing you. For having us back. You've been lifetime friends. Well, that's, lifetime that's friends. same here. You know, as a kid growing up, I mean, I, you were one of the, those collectors that I looked up and admired, and to actually have a chance and the opportunity to sit down and interview you, Man, dude, I, like seriously, no joke. I can't tell you how much of a thrill this is. This is so. This has been. This is cool and it's been fun. So what I'd like to do is I'd like Just to think how much you've changed from being a preppy. God, I know. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. It's like. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to jump on in here and go ahead and let's start talking about the crib because we've got a lot of information we want to cover. Uh, you know, that, the crib is without a doubt, especially in the collector world, one of the most talked about sites there is. You know, how old were you? What was it? When, when did you first hear about the crib? And when did you first go? What happened then? When I first uh, heard about it, uh, people said I should go down and see a cemetery. And I was in high school. I was going to high school in St. Louis. And uh, <clears throat> so I took two of my, three of my friends from Chaminade where I went to high school and I took them with me and we went over and went to the crib mound. When we went there I was just awestruck. I mean there were just literally thousands of bones on the beach. I mean you'd pick something up and no disrespect I didn't want to do that but here would be an arm bone or there would be a leg bone. Uh, totally disarticulated. In other words the river had come up, slammed it and nobody picked the bones up. And this was around 1954. And then <clears throat> later, when I discovered, well, this must contain something more than bones, you know, and uh, I love Indian relics. I've been hunting since the eighth grade. Uh, uh, where is Buddy Scheidegger? So I went to Buddy Scheidegger's house in Candleton, and Helen Scheidegger was his, was his wife, and I said, Helen, where's Buddy? I want to talk to him. She said, oh, He's where he always is. He's down to Crib Mountain. I said, just explain that again to me where it is, because, you know, it's been a long time, uh, six, seven years. And she explained, and I went down, and I said, buddy, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking around to the shelves for arrowheads. He said, look, here's the ones I found so far, and got me hooked. There's probably one thing we should we should discuss uh, right off the bat is is the conditions of the crib mound you know what caused this particular site to deteriorate now the crib mound is literally on the bank of the ohio river it is when the crib mound first started i don't know this figure to be exact but when buddy shattiger saw it in 1937 before it started washing in there were like 18 rows of corn in front of the crib and it was a big hill it was a mound yeah and uh, what happened as the river came up with the dams, as you say, it raised the river level. Because it comes into a curve, the water comes real swift at the, at the bank of the crib. Yeah. So it started washing the cornfield away. So the whole reason that, these, that this site even began its journey to destruction was in the 1930s, during the CCC or the WPA, the, the government controlling of... Mystic River, putting these dams in, where, which raised the water level. And then the biggest flood of all time, 1937, occurred. Yeah, and just started eating into the bank. Because as you said, the way the water runs, that channel kind of hits the bank directly. Hits the bank hard. Yeah. And so this starts the destruction of the mound. It, the water's going up and down, eating away the bank. See, this dirt has all been put in. Right. And it's not like a hard pan land a bank where the water, the, the dirt hasn't been nothing done to it in thousands of years. Uh, several thousand years ago, these people built the crib from debris, but it built up to be a mound. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason when you first went to the crib that you started seeing all of these bones and everything laying around the crib. But when I went the next time to see Buddy Shattiger, yeah. All the bones were gone. Were gone. Were washed away. Washed away. Washed down. Whatever away. happened, yes. So how did you first hear about the crib? Well, I had, you know, there were talk around home about this uh, this place down there, James's Bar, that they called it, and 
people used to go down there to swim and launch their boats and have parties. And uh, a friend of mine said, you ought to go down. There's so much shell and, and uh, uh, pieces of flint and things like that. He said, just go down and take a look. So me and my friends, I went to school in St. Louis to Chaminade and, and I had some border friends. Borders were the people that stayed at school. And uh, I said, three of them that were kind of adventurous, I said, let's go over to my home and let's go to this, uh, I don't know what it is, a mound or, or a habitat or something. And I said, it's kind of fascinating. So we drove over there about 1954 and went down on the beach and my God, there were just shells everywhere. Uh, the beach just glittered like it was snow almost, so many shells and, and uh, uh, a huge bank, maybe 18 or 20 feet high and uh, a foundation of what looked like and what I know now is the, is the crib where the crib mound was farmed. There's two corn cribs. Uh, so we saw the foundation of that. And we poked around. There's a few pieces of flint. I had no thoughts of finding an Indian artifact. And so we had our little adventure and we got back in the car and went other places. Uh, but then I got out of college in 1960 and immediately I went into the Air Force. I was an aeromedic in the Air Force and uh, for six years. And, uh, but you're not an aeromedic all the time. So I'd come home and unbelievable to me, 1961 was the best year of production of relics that the Crib Mound has ever achieved. Why would native peoples particularly pick this certain site? Because see, that's what's really fascinating about the crib is, is that it's a multicultural site. You know, it spans from the archaic period all the way up through the Mississippi and arguably into the historic yeah, the period. Short period right. And a lot of these sites like that, there, there's only a handful of sites that have a continuous occupation. What was it about this particular place that 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 drove the native cultures to settle there? Well, was obviously it the geology? archaic people fixed very picked very well. It was a sandy knoll out in the middle of a field where they started, a sandy knoll. And there was a natural mussel bed mm -hmm. right in front of the crib. Some river mussels. River mussels and water source for uh -huh. fish. And the high hills in back of there was sort of sacred to them because they could put somebody up as a guard or it might have been a sacred place that they made a little hike to, but there's a lot of game. You fish the creeks, you hunt the beavers, you, uh, whatever, you know, out of the creek. But there was a creek that surrounded the crib called Crooked Creek. So it was a natural barricade. I mean, uh, not that it wouldn't take a lot to get across the creek, but you still have to ford right. a creek. So this particular spot seemed to be just, you know, very Ideal. well, yeah, very well set up for him. And the sun, when it came up in the morning, hit the crib. Wow. Now you live in the winter around here and all you do is burn fires. There's lots of fire beds at the crib, but you just burn fires, you're cold. And so when that sun comes up in the morning and hits you first thing, say it was behind you, that's not cool. But when it comes up and hits you, that's a cool thing. And the sunrises at the crib were magnificent. Wow, oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Native peoples really had their eye for everything that they needed in order to survive, you know, naturally defensible area, a great location of, of mussels. You know, that's one of the things a lot of people realize is, is, you know, we think all of our shellfish and mussels and stuff come out of the sea. But, you know, in prehistoric times and in historic times, you know, a, a, a ridiculous amount of freshwater mussels, shells, and clams were harvested and consumed by peoples uh, up until, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, sometimes even up until today. First clam bake, you know. Yeah, first clam bake. Uh, there are some areas in the, United, in the United States, particularly at Upper East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, on the Clinch River, that have some of the largest diversity of freshwater mussels in the world, you know, is in Southwest Virginia. Upper wow. East Tennessee, yeah, you know, so so you know to to have to pick a site where you have this continuous endless supply of mussels uh, available to you th all throughout the year, that seems like a the, people uh, wonder how the crib got to be so big. Well, you had a lot of people eating these mussels, and there were abundance of the mussels, 
and when you eat them, you throw them down. And as you do that through the centuries, it just builds up. And you builds just build up. up. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is an interesting you know way to look at art. So we have got this site that is the most ideal site to for possibly prehistoric peoples to inhabit. And I guess that kind of answers this question. You know, other sites such as you know Cahokia are these huge famous sites. Uh, you know that were all contemporary to the crib mounds existence. Uh, you know, what made sites, I guess, political sites such as you know, Cahokia and others uh, come and go and the crib stand the test of time? Well, they probably had a more uh, stable governing force. You know, you have uh, unstableness, probably uh, disrupted the Cahokia and uh, some instability, some maybe a famine, maybe, maybe trade, bad crap, mm -hmm. uh, bad crop some year. Yeah. Uh, whereas the crib didn't depend on crops until they got to the woodland period. Right. So the earlier people that made it and discovered the place, and I'm sure that the Hopewell, Dina, Dina coming a little bit before the Hopewell, Dina Hopewell people came in and thought, wow, this is really cool. And so they just stayed there. And then when they stayed there, uh, the next period, which is the Mississippian, getting almost into you know more modern times, uh, time of Columbus or whatever, uh, they stayed there. And it just stands the reason if all these people for 4,500 years have been there, the later Indians would settle on there too and have a little Indian yeah. village. Just a good, good spot. Just a good go. spot. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, and when you've got permanent spots like this, permanent settlements, you know, you get a variety of cultures that are creating these artifacts, you know, throughout it. You know, what's uh, and if you've got a place that exists for a long time, you know, you've got people from other areas coming in, wanting to see the site, visit the site, trade with the people at the site. You know, what's kind of the diversity of some of the material that was found at this site? You know, how far did some of this stuff travel? You know, were, were, is there physical evidence of, let's say, obsidian from Mexico found at the crib, you know, or, or copper from the Great Lakes found at the crib, or mica from East Tennessee found there? You know, is, is there archaeological evidence that shows that, you know, people's tr traveled great distances to visit there, to trade there, or their trade goods made it there. What's the evidence uh, for, for Well, that? you can, uh, the evidence is when you look at the diversity of the points, the diversity of material that they're made from, Ohio pipes, uh, Ohio Flint Ridge, uh, <coughs> you have uh, obsidian maybe from uh, uh, Colorado out west, uh, maybe from Mexico as you say, you have mica, uh, you have all kinds of exotic uh, material we found two or three pieces of fluorspar, which come from southern Illinois near Rosiclair. How did how did these prehistoric cultures sustain themselves? Oh yes. How yes. do they do this financially? You know, how do they do it nutritionally? You know, how well, how, how, how was their day to day? The earliest people meant? and the crib started not at early archaic but middle archaic, and middle archaic was the Bannerstone period. So they knew the technology of hurling a spear with an ladle which gives you 200 times more mechanical force than hand throwing a spear. So they had ways of getting game. But I will guarantee you that their entire existence, maybe for the males, maybe the females did, I don't want to be uh, prejudicial, but they went hunting, they went fishing, they went muscle diving, and it was subsistence. Mm -hmm. Their whole life was, and winter's coming, we gotta have enough fuel to burn fires continuously. You're outdoors with nothing but your skin and the hides and some animals and uh, it's a hard, hard life. So these earliest people, all they were doing is surviving. Now here come the Hopewell, Much or the Woodland period, the Adena probably before them. They were smart enough. The Hopewell, by the way, started at 500 BC to 200 AD, just so you get a time reference. And they knew how to farm, mm -hmm. how to grow maize. And one of the things that they knew how to, to grow was nicotania. Mm -hmm. Now nicotania, for the people that don't know, I don't smoke, but nicotine is very addictive. Nicotania is perhaps 10 times stronger. And uh, that produced commerce commerce and trade because people wanted this high-end. Well, according to a highly respected archaeology, Dr. Uh, Richard Michael Gramley, 
who's a PhD uh, archaeologist from uh, Harvard, he postulated this theory to me. He said, I want to run this by yard. I theorize that because the Hopewell, mainly 90% of the time, settled on major rivers. He said, now that was for the exchange thing. They wanted the exotic material, so people are coming down the river with the exotic material. And uh, he said, it's not a trade route, but it's a trade exchange. They just stayed there and people brought things to them. But he said to me, the Hopewell were the first drug lords, <laughs> El Patron. He said, what happened? They would put a net, say, across the Ohio River. Here comes some seafaring people down with their dugout canoes, and they're wanting to pass, and the Hopewell are there with their spears going, no, no, come over and talk. And they'd say, well, what's the deal? And they'd say, well, we control this stretch of the river if you want to pass. You've got a lot of beavers. Now, we're just not wanting to take them from you. We're going to trade. We have this Nicotania. I'll guarantee you, you'll come back within two miles because you'll smoke it and come say, hey, can I get some more of that? And he said, you got them hooked because he said nicotine is addicted. See, this this kind of setup is very much like you know the opium wars of the 1840s and 50s in, uh, in China that the British. That's right. You know, tried to do you know this whole trick of you know, hey, look, you know, we, we want some of your trade goods, so uh, here's this great stuff. You know, we'll, we'll give you a free sample. It's, it's a little little taste, little once taste. Once they hook you, yeah. Once they hook you, then you're coming back for more, bringing all of your stuff to trade and gather. All right. So another thing, you know, about you know, we got people living at the crib, you know, adjacent to it. You've got the mound, but they're also adjacent to the crib. These two beehive mound Hopewell structures, not within not necessarily stones throw, but within, you know, decent walking distance of this site. You know, what what, what were these two beehive mound structures? That I, uh, you know, they've never been dug and it's... Uh, Do they still it, exist? They exist and it's important that they not be dug, I, I think. Uh, but uh, same token, I think the Hopewell elite are probably buried in a beehive mound. Mm -hmm. And uh, in other words, they lived down here all their life and it was kind of smelly and nice. And you know, they, but they said, now we want to be buried. We'd like to be buried up here on top of this hill. Same way people in Egypt maybe would live in a city, but they wanted to go out to the pyramids if they were an elite right. class that could afford it. They wanted to be embalmed and put in and make a mummy. You know, I like what you said a minute ago, and I just wanted to clarify it, maybe deepen on it, on it just a little bit. You know, there's a, for China, in, uh, for example, they know where the existence of the first emperor of China is is buried. He, he, he lived around uh, 238 BC, and they know the location of his burial, the the uh, famous terracotta city. What they discovered that that is the guard, the people that are guarding him laid out in a military formation around they have his been burial. Excavated all of it. The only thing that's been excavated is the terracotta warriors themselves. The tomb itself hasn't been investigated for a very interesting reason because they're waiting for the technology to exist to improve where they could non intrusively scan the entirety of the burial, tell everything that is in there before they even touch it without turning the soil. Now you said that, you know, these two beehive mounds that are adjacent are probably where the elite people of this uh, of this site would be located. Now, when you said you did, you don't think that they should be dug, did you mean that, you know, they should wait for these non-intrusive tools of archaeology well, to come I think around? later uh, years we dig up, uh, if archaeologists dig up everything now, there'll be nothing left for future generations. But something structurally as neat and interestingly as neat uh, probably should be preserved until our scientific knowledge keeps increasing. We're, we're going at exponential rates, you know, I mean a computer was this and now it's this and now there's a little tiny camera as big as a, a GoPro. Mm -hmm making great movies so technology advances quickly and we'll maybe get to a point where we can use scanning x-rays or whatever we got that could just delineate the whole inside like you're looking at it on your hand and that way you would never really have to never have to you know no there's be nice to preserve these yeah for somebody and uh, 
2,500 or 2,600. You know, it's funny when you talk to geophysical archaeologists, you know, the archaeologists that are specific for the science of ground penetrating radar and using machines to look into the ground. You know, almost all of them that I've ever met or talked to, you know, look at the actual excavators, the diggers of archaeology and say, you know, I'm trying to keep put you out of a job, you know, uh, because the technology is, as you're saying, you know, is getting, it's getting rather, where, rather good, you know, that that but we can and it's just neat that we're that we have the opportunity to wait and be patient you know for this technology to be available where we can look at a site non-intrusively completely and leave it intact. Mm -hmm. Art in your book you said that you prefer uh, to name you know at least one period of the people that inhabited the crib site the 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 shell people the shell culture what did you what did you mean by this what do you what do you why do you prefer that name why did you come up with the name the shell people as opposed to any other name that's well been delineated towards i it? rather than call the middle archaic that nobody understands if you're it's kind of a colloquialism uh just something that endeared me to him that they ate all these shells so they're shell people yeah and because they were shell people, I asked a physical anthropologist once, I said, is there, do we know how big they were? He said, they weren't very big, they didn't live very long, but he said, what stunted their growth was an enzyme imbalance produced by eating all these muscle shells. So I thought that was quite interesting. Really, that is really fascinating. It's really fascinating. Uh, the earliest occupation of the crib is the archaic period, and in my opinion, one of the most fantastic uh, discoveries from that particular period found there or at any other site is the group of stone cups that were found there. What are these artifacts? What You know, I have postulated, I perhaps have all but maybe three or four cups ever found. I got a pretty complete collection, all from the crib mound, by the way. And a lot of them are made of limestone, some of them are made of granite, and some of them show pecking or not pecking but they have been pecked with on the bottom and i think that they were crushing up something with the cup then they put it in there put a little liquid stir it around maybe drink it i don't know it's some kind of a ceremonial thing because they never were very big they weren't used to have your morning soup it was a, a tonic in my opinion one of the most fascinating discoveries that was made at the crib and especially uh, for us collectors today was the cache of, uh, of 42 points that were found in the woodland level but the points themselves date to the archaic period can you explain that cache? they were actually found intact in a clay ball it was maybe the person's purse safe wow. he was a collector he was definitely a collector, and he didn't only collect off of the crib archaic period, he went other places because there's multi uh, different types of arrows that weren't found at the crib. So this man went on his hunts and he'd look down the field and pick this up, put it in his, his little knapsack and off he went. And he got together an accumulation of over 40 and he put them in a clay ball and stuck them in the ground, and that's what we found. One of the big famous things about the crib is the amount, the absolute ridiculous amount of banner stones that are discovered at this site. Oh you know, my Probably goodness. more so than any other site in North America, wouldn't you, wouldn't you possibly? Well, Buddy Scheidegger told me, he said a lot of people say that Paradise, Kentucky, Indian Knoll, is the start of the banners, but he said, I'll defy anybody and Buddy Schattiger put a card table out and the picture's in my book, The Art Gerber Story, and there's a mound of banners. Now they're not all whole, they're not all completely drilled, but this is one man's finding of banners. And when he was young, he sold a lot of things. Wow. Yeah, there was pickers that come through, and yeah. like now, and they bought, you know, give him maybe 25 cents for a banner. <laughs> he thought he was rich. But it's just fascinating that at this one site, so many were, were discovered. Why do you think that was? You know, were people uh, 
collect, were they producing banner stones there? Were banner stones just happened to, to come there? You know, uh, what, I always wondered that myself, uh, you know, but uh, to me, I would truly consider the crib the heart of the banner stone culture. Banner stone culture. I mean, I can't explain all the reasons. Uh, maybe it was easy access to the materials that you make banner stones. You got a river, you got people going down it. Uh, you send people out collecting, you got a person that knew how to make banners and he held it down his, his talent. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there was an abundance of river cane because these banners are drilled with river cane and sand. that's spinning yeah. sand and water. Might be a two-man job. I don't know if they knew the bowstring thing yet. Might be just with their hand, but uh, that's the way they drilled them. You know, you, you touched on something, you know, about this site being the heart of the Bannerstone culture, mm -hmm. the Bannerstone period. Uh, later on in later phases of the crib, you know, you see these necklaces with Bannerstones incorporated into the jewelry in later periods. Right. You know, do you think that maybe that that's because as time went on, the use of the banner stone faded for other advances in technology. And so because they're not used so much anymore, they were kind of more revered, kind well, of like I think, how... I think that the people that came later that made these more exotic looking banner stones uh, looked back on the past and said, you know, my grandfather told me that they had this stick it had a, not a banner stone, they didn't know to call it that, but this weight on it. And they slung a spear and it would go 10 times farther than I could ever throw one. And so we're into bows now, a little more efficient, but what if they're very superstitious people? So what if we made a really exotic banner stone, put some beads with it and we wore it? Wouldn't that help our hunting and our sustaining the, the population here. Makes sense. And I think it was a uh, superstitious uh, ornamental kind of thing. They, they thought it was pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, you know kind of like how, and I guess this may be pertaining to uh, uh, some of the axes and stuff that was made. You know, it's like, you know, we have uh, gold records that are made, not meant to be used, but are a reproduction of an original record from you know, right. records that we give away as awards. You know, people all the time have you know the golden hammer, or the golden screwdriver, or whatever that we give away. These really exotic uh, tools that are used for show, for class, for status, right. as opposed to you know something well, Stanley, to be used. One of the biggest tool companies. They make a commemorative tool in a real pretty box and. Somebody that's a carpenter, you give it to them for yeah. one of 500, you give them to them for a birthday or Christmas. You know, let's get into copper a little bit. You know, there were so many fantastic copper artifacts discovered at the crib. You know, and these, uh, what's neat is, is that a lot of these artifacts were, in a sense, copies of, you know, the, the old copper culture of the Great Lakes. You know, why were they copying artifacts from that, that particular culture? You know, because the old copper culture is arguably uh, the, the greatest copper working culture in North America. Uh, well, it stands the reason that these people were in a trade route. Mm -hmm. They're on one of the major rivers of the United States, the Ohio River. And coming into that from north, the Wabash River almost comes down the entire length of Indiana. Mm -hmm. So it stands the reason that people could come down that, they could go up the Ohio. They didn't always have to come down the mm -hmm. Ohio. So when they went by, they had this really heavy, heavy rock that they thought was actually a piece of copper and uh, they could trade. Mm -hmm. But I've never found loose copper at the crib. It was so precious that they always made always it into made. an artifact. But why were they copying the artifacts from way up north? It was just because they liked that stuff from an older culture. Well, they may have brought some of their weapons with them, uh -huh. and they said, oh, yeah, this is what we're going to make. And, you know, they didn't have a camera to take a picture, but they had a memory. Yeah. So, you know, you said you saw I hardly ever saw any raw copper at I the I never site. saw any copper nuggets. So either they were using it or... They were using all that, of it up. Yeah. So 
So that means you think that they were manufacturing the copper artifacts on site, or they? Oh yes, in I the think trade? so. Yeah. And here's what I've always found fascinating is, you know, when you get into copper, and this is something that a lot of people don't even recognize or realize, and one of the things that make the Western Hemisphere more fascinating and interesting than, you know, the Eastern Hemisphere, Europe, Eurasia, and the Asiatic continent is, is that the very first time in human history that a metal was actually worked into a tool wasn't around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers or all these other famous sites, but it was here. 9,500 years ago in the Kenai Peninsula in Michigan, native cultures were working metal, were working copper. What always fascinated me... And they were mining. And they were mining metal and copper. And, and what always fascinated me is, is that we were the first to extract, mine, and use copper metal artifacts that uh, they never figured out how to smelt it how to melt it, pour it, cast into other things. Cold hammer. It was all cold hammer. They never took other metals and mixed it with it. They never took tin to create bronze. They never, they never went beyond that initial technology. You know, another thing that's prevalently found on the crib are, you know, axes and celts. You know, there's a lot of questions out there maybe some of our viewers out there don't realize is, is that axes are a very old form, an archaic form of tool for cutting Trees full down, groove axe. right? Full grooved axe. Later in the woodland period and sequentially the Mississippi period, you get a, a, an evolution of that tool. A three quarter groove axe. Three quarter groove axe, and then beyond that, you get celts. Celts. And that is the final, the final production of, of axe technology that was produced. Uh, one of the things that I really uh, super like from the crib is an axe, a three quarter groove axe, and a celt. They're all. They're small, but the same token, they're made of a really exotic, beautiful granite of the same stone. But, you know, there are fantastic pieces that are found. Do you think they're kind of like the Bannersons? They would make it just to kind of put it off to the side? My grandmother told me, and Grandma raised me, but she knew nothing about Indian artifacts. In fact, she told me they grew that way. But uh, <laughs> other than that... You know, I said, well, Grandma, some of these I find are so pretty, and some of them are just kind of like they're sloppily done. And she said, I'll tell you, Arthur, Arthur Joe, she called me. She said, Arthur Joe, one woman can make a dress, another woman can make a mess. Now, Art, what was the variety of the assemblage of bone tools that were discovered at the crib, you know, awls, hairpins, what, you know, bone tools are, for, are found throughout all periods of Native history, but, you know, for, specific for the crib, you know, do you see the same assemblage of tools that you would see at other sites, or were there specific tools? You see more of them. You see more? Okay, because see it's more. a shell mound, and as we possibly talked, but what people may not know, when you have a highly calcified soil, it's going to produce uh, protective layers mm -hmm. on bone, mm -hmm. and it's not going to dissolve it like the ordinary soil acids do. Right. It may have made the soil neutral or basic. Yeah, yeah. And, it, neutral, then, it neutralizes out the right, acidity. Right. Neutralizes the, soil. the acid out, and so the bone is going to stay for yeah. eons. And see, what we're talking about is, is that soil in and of itself, through rain or whatever, it, natural chemical properties of most soil, it varies to places, but they're acidic. And what is acid, it dissolves things, it dissolves organic materials. So that's why perishable artifacts such as cloth, bone, shell, you know, these artifacts don't really survive. And what Art's discussing is, is that the calcium uh, levels, the high levels of calcium that's, that is deposited into the soil from other various sources kind of acts as a neutralizing agent that kind of freezes freeze, freeze the, the these artifacts. And just made yeah. it uh, like it was. And especially when they polished all the pores shut, like they did to make a really fine hairpin, the water can't seep in. Right. What kind of things, what, what kind of tools did you see, as far as bone tools, did you see most prevalent? Were there more oh. hairpins to awls? Oh. Were there more uh, There were a lot of fish to, hooks. There were incredible, a lot of fish hooks. A lot of fish hooks, and there were a lot of uh, bone awls. Uh, call them trigger awls or turkey awls uh -huh. or whatever kind of awls, but there are a lot of awls. And the hairpins were in a dearth, uh, in a small supply, because um, it just took longer to make them, and maybe uh, people went to the hereafter with their hairpin, you know, yeah. you never know. Yeah. 
Now, effigy pieces, uh, you know, what, it, what effigies are is, is they're animal, humanistic, anamorphic, whatever you have you, uh, artistic uh, uh, carvings uh, in stone or made out of pottery or bone or whatever. Uh, was the crib site known for effigy pieces? Were there well, a it had a lot, uh, but uh, the only really uh, effigies that I have, I have a little human figure that was found maybe a hundred yards down from the crib, but it's definitely the crib people probably carried it down there, but it's an actual figurine. And then uh, I have two or three pipes that have animal effigies mm -hmm. on them. But uh, actually, the effigy part, a uh, little bit slim there at the crib. Really? So they didn't really yeah. make it. So there's probably sites around the crib that oh, had I'm sure more there were of these uh, effigies. The Mississippian culture yeah. produced a lot of effigies. And then the Ohio Hopewell seemed to be more effigy oriented than the crib people. And it just did. didn't seem to right. trickle down. They were near the source of their material, which is Ohio Pipestone. Right. Now, Art, what's yeah. fascinating is, is that probably the, what the crib is most famous for is the crib mound catch. The a ridiculous amount of blades that were discovered there. What, how did that happen? And you are one, one of only two guys left that are still Yes, there were three of us. That. There were three of us that discovered it. Uh, buddy, buddy Edward Scheidegger uh -huh. from Candleton here, where we're photographing from. And then uh, Chuck Denzinger, which is a gentleman that owned the motel up at uh, Cardin, Indiana, which is Harrison County, mm -hmm. which is actually where the flint and the chipping was done on this uh, large cache. Now, what what was that day like? When you oh my God, uh, uh, I went down, and. Um, Buddy Scheidegger was standing on a particular spot of the crib, kind of like he was a guard. <laughs> and Buddy said, uh, where are you going to be mainly honey art? And I looked around and there was all this black, black dirt, which is uh, significant because the black dirt is normally the woodland, the Hopewell period. And uh, I said, I don't know, Buddy, where are you going? He said, right here. And I said, well, guess what? I'm right beside you. You don't want to go anyplace else? And I said, right here. And Chuck, he's got his head down, don't know what to say, and because they both found it. They went down and the flood receded, and there they were, laying there. So uh, I looked at him and I said, uh, yeah, right here. And Buddy said, uh, I'm, there's only three of us, and I don't know why he said this, but he said, come over to the side, Art, I want to talk to you about this. Will you swear to me you can keep a secret? He said, this is something so big that we don't want anybody else involved. I said, how do we know? And he said, I know. He said, uh, let me show you something. So he reached down and he had pulled the dirt over these blades when he saw me coming. You can see somebody coming for about a half mile. So he brushed the dirt back and he always called me old boy. He said, oh boy, look down here. I said, oh my, gee whiz, that's a lot of them. <laughs> and he said, there's going to be more than we can count. The next question is, is did these originate here? You know, the material, where, where, where was this material from? Where do these um, blades come from? Now, uh, for somebody that uh, is familiar with all the various kinds of flints, we probably know this, but this is Harrison County Chert. Mm -hmm. And Harrison County is like two counties up from where the crib mound is. But to get there by the river is about 100 miles. 100 miles of river travel. Wow. And a dugout canoe, I'm sure. But to save things, because we know now there were over 10,000 of these blades, uh, we know that they chipped them in place at the quarries and then put them in their dugout, brought them down here, and they stacked them in systematic rows, one on top of the other. So they weren't piled nilly-willy just all not, over. Not helping they the skelter. Were, they very were, nicely. Was there any dirt layers in between? No, no. It was just 
flint on flint, and the pit went 16 feet across, four feet high that we estimate, and how far back that pit went, we'll never know because we were continuously removing blades from the pit. So do you think they they were all laid down at one time or over the course well, of I the think, generation? Well, I think it took uh, uh, probably several weeks, several months, even with several nappers on site to make these things, then make the arduous travel by boat down here, and then they would put them out. And it was, I, I always thought it was a farm of currency. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were stockpiling like we would... Uh, you know, well, it makes sense because it doesn't take you, it doesn't take a flint nap or a native person very much time uh, in order to go from a blank like this into a finished arrowhead, and it can be whatever arrowhead type you can imagine. This is the blank, blank check for it, and all you do is is you can pick what kind of base you want for it. Do you want it serrated? Do you not want it serrated? So I believe that your description of it as a form of currency is the most accurate way to describe this. You know, now because what what's the most important thing that you have? The most important thing that any of us have is time, and the time that it takes to go from the original rock, the rough rock, to this is a far greater span of time than to go from this and turn it into an arrowhead. Right. So time, once we have the thinness, yeah, they can always thin it even more. Yeah, they can make any type of implement. They could take one of these and they'd have a pocket knife, they'd have an arrow, they'd have a scraper, they'd have all the tools they need right. in this blank once they utilize it. So this is an ancient bank, a vault of an ancient bank, and they're all laid down at the same time, not roughly, over, roughly sure. you know, not over the course of a hundred no, years no, or a no, thousand no, years, no. but within a couple of years of each other. Yeah, easily. You know, what what and not and, and seemingly they weren't removed. It seems like they were all placed down at the same time. What would be the cause of that? Why? What would be the reasoning for that? Well, they were um, they were probably hiding them from other people for one thing. I mean, if you've got a uh, uh, something that you buried, it's because you want to keep it safe. And I'm sure that uh, there are probably other tribes, not their own people, but somebody else that may want them. Right. A little bit more, so they got a safeguard, and they safeguarded them for over two thousand years. Yeah. Do you think that they were? That, well, are you to say they safeguarded them for two thousand years? Do you think that you know this was kind of like a just in case of an emergency? Here's this pile of what they consider. No, I think it's, I think it's like we would stockpile raw material. Mm -hmm. if you're going to build a house. You're going to bring in a lot of bricks. Um, if you're going to um, uh, put asphalt or concrete or whatever you're going to bring your concrete trucks in, you know, it's that kind of thing. They they had a storage. What period of time is this? What uh, are we talking about? We're in the woodland period of time, mm -hmm. and we're actually <clears throat> more specifically in the Hopewell. Mm -hmm. And the Hopewell started at 500 B.C. until 200 A.D. It was a short period of time, 700 years, but it was the greatest creative time of the prehistoric people. Now what's neat about the these are the patina or the caliche build up on these artifacts. <clears throat> what, is, what What is caliche deposits? What is this patina that forms on artifacts? Um, what happened, Chase? If you think about a cave, mm -hmm. drip, 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 the water drips down through the ground, it has calcium in it. That calcium makes the lag tights, which are the ones on the ceiling, the ones on the bottom are stalagmites. And then you have calcified deposits in there. This is the same thing that happened. Through the centuries, water leached down through these artifacts, and slowly but surely, it deposited calcium. Chase, what we have here are some really fine hairpins from the crib mound, all found by me. In fact, this one is highly engraved and it's missing a back, but it's been redone by the Indian. Some people in the archeological community, not Dr. Gramley, not Dr. Gramley, but a lot of archeologists now believe that unless you find something in situ and meticulously put down all the depth and uh, what's there and, and uh, weigh the dirt and look for the seeds and the, 
microbes and all this kind of stuff. It's not right. But I believe you can go to a museum, look at their collection, and think, well, the Aborigines in Africa, the Aborigines in wherever, you know, they're using that allattle yet today. Mm -hmm. That's an allattle hook. Yeah. And we can gain a lot of information by just looking at collections. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the people that collect it now are saving history in my mind. I mean, uh, the science of archaeology is systematic destruction. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. You have to destroy some. You're recording it, mm -hmm. but you're destroying some to get to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. Whereas we have the nth degree and we're theorizing about it. And I think that's very important too. I think both, both are good. I'm not saying the archaeologists recording every small detail is not a good thing. That is a good thing. But there are a lot more collectors in the world than there are the handful of archaeologists. That's right. So it only stands the reason that an archaeologist best friend should be his collector down the road or the collector down the road should befriend the archaeologists and channel their knowledge well you know for the same simple fact of economics you know there for what is a fact is there is no funding for archaeology no so what collectors do is is they themselves take it upon themselves to take their time and their money and they go out and collect, preserve, save artifacts from sites. And the crib is a perfect example. This is a site that, you know, what the, the opportunity was there for the archaeological community to come in and excavate it. Yet, they were, it was a race against the clock. Ever since the damming of the Ohio River and the raising and lowering of the floodwaters, every time that water go up, it would cover the site, and when it would go back down, it would erase more of that site. So the site was vanishing and vanishing and vanishing. Right in front of your eyes. And the archaeological community didn't have the money or the funding or the time to go to that site and to preserve it. So now you have these people that have time on their hands and the money to do so to walk out there, collect these materials before the river washed it downstream. You know, it's like these pieces here, if they weren't collected, they would be 100% gone. I well, guess it's saying something is better than nothing. Right. You know? And these pieces are better than, than nothing. Well, it's actually, I mean, uh, you have to be into our, our hobby or our frame of mind, but these, to me, are art pieces. Yes, well, they are. These were in the bun of a hair. Mm -hmm. And it has a hole in it because he didn't want to run through the woods and lose it. Right. Or he hung it around his neck. It could be a multi-tool. It could be an awl or a hairpin. But mostly they're, they're hairpins, mm -hmm. uh, including this ornate one. Uh, to make an awl, you wouldn't do all this engraving. You just make a sharp piece of bone, and punch a hole in your leather. Mm -hmm. But they went to the extra time and fashioned a back. They did engraving up here. They put a hole in it. They, uh, it's very graceful. It's uh, aesthetically, it's nice. So these pieces are this. Yes, sir. All right. So you, we've got you know bone tools used throughout all period of native history from the Paleo all the way up to the Mississippi. But what's one of the main things that have changed in bone tools throughout those periods? Well, I think as we come closer to modern day, let's call it, um, we're, say, at the time of Christ, they thought a lot about art. And the reason that they could think about art, Chase, the earliest people, the people back in the archaic period, were hunter-gatherers. They had to go hunt the game. They had to gather up the berries. As we become more advanced, now we're still 2,000 years ago, they become an agrarian society where they could grow their own food. So then a lot of people can stay in the same place. And when you collectively have a lot of people thinking about the same thing, that's where knowledge mm -hmm. comes in. Well, you free Before up. Before you're just trying to survive. Yeah. It's, 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 basically free time. You have time to create. You have time to be artistic because your food source, like if you're growing crops, is there. It's and there. you got the river. You got the mussel shells. You got the fish. You've got a continuous supply. Right. That's why food. they were there because they had a continuous food source. The hills around kept the animals mm -hmm. and uh, they had uh, bows. They didn't have guns where they shot everything and right. exhausted the supply. They had a hard time hunting. 
But when they come to this period of time, they didn't actually have to hunt so much. They could grow. And that's where they could create fine pieces like what you Right, and there. they become more of the ascent. This, you could take a twig and sharpen the end and put it through the bun of your hair and you'd have a hairpin. Mm -hmm. Or you could have a more plainer variety where you just have a nice slender bone, you polish it down, it's shiny. That's a hairpin. Or you could go to this length where you have engraving, you have a hole, you have it in your bun of your hair, and you have a string around it. So if you run through the woods and a tree snags your bun, you're going to save your piece that was so laborious to make. Mm -hmm. And these pieces that I have in here were all found by me, but believe it or not, they were all, except for the small uh, fish hook and this piece, pressure cracked, where the pressure of the earth came down on them and broke them in half, but I found both pieces so I could put them back together. So they were pressure cracked due to the water getting within the... No, the pressure of the soil. Right. As more and more soil builds up, dirt's really, really heavy. And unless this has a really firm support, it's the dirt underneath will give, and it's going to fracture at the weakest point. So but out of this period, we have these fantastic pieces of art incorporated into everyday use. Right. And that's something that we don't see before, and that's something that we rarely see after. Do you think that it has to do with the political structure of the Hopewell period? You know, these great earthen mound city-states? Uh, well, I'm that sure they did. I mean, why did the Hopewell build these great earthworks? Say the one at uh, General Electric, I'm quite familiar with it. It took something like 480,000 basketfuls of bottom muck construct this mm -hmm. monument to eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay, Art, mm -hmm. this pipe that you've got here, this is without a doubt, in not only your opinion, but the opinions of several people. Show, several people in the show, this is the finest pipe out of the Hopewell culture. Well, I wouldn't say, <clears throat> I can't go so far as to say, if you had an effigy Hopewell monitor pipe with an eagle there or right. beaver or somebody, I think you beat me. But as far as a platform pipe, this is what they call a platform pipe. It would be almost a communal pipe. In other words, Chase can't smoke this whole bowl or whatever they're going to put in here. Right. But the community, you pass it around to your friend. And everybody gets to share in a platform pipe. This is another one of those artifacts that, that are created within the Hopewell culture because there is time for creating a magnificent piece because if you look at this piece look how much material you have to remove in order Stop to production right in order to produce such a just a large piece pipestone which this is from ohio and it's a, it's a rarity of the hopewell and they love the pipestone this is the color of the original pipestone mm -hmm. and then as they handled it and used it and everything become this kind of patinated and that brings us to another uh, facet of collecting that we always have to worry about. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that man made a thousand years ago, I give a man enough money, enough material, and the right kind of tools, he can reproduce that today. Right. So this pipe could have been reproduced. So what we do is, one of the things, we would get a certificate of authenticity. This coming from a real good friend of mine, Tony Putty. And he says, from the Paul Keller, Keller collection in 1964, and this is the pipe from Ironton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. It's right on the Ohio River. And then I went further. I said, well, I want to know the molecular structure I'm getting down to just the fine little points. I mean, more than that dot, smaller yet. And so we had a test done in Ohio using a scanning electronic microscope that gets down the surfaces. This time it was 200 times what you can see by the naked eye. And 160 digital images created. Semi-legible corrector inscription includes iron in Ohio Providence. So once they looked at this, they saw, I can't even find it, that somewhere on this pipe, it actually said, 
Ironton, Ohio, Barbara's and through family. the handling, it's rubbed off. But there, they can go to 200 power, and you can see the impression on the stone. And then they did the with high intensity XMLT5 LED and multi diameter bore diffusion lighting. In other words, they went into this bore and they looked at it digitally. Mm -hmm. Now, has this got, when you made it, you had to do circular. Is that got it in it? And all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And then they went further. They did infrared microscopy. I can't even pronounce that word. Analysis of three surfaces, the upper stem, lower stem, and the bowl. And then the artifacts placed in a one cubic foot vacuum chamber and observation of the gases that were made from a mass spectrographer. A spectrometer. I said the word wrong, spectrometer. While the pressure was reduced to a period of 30, 30 minutes, no indication of adhesives or uh, prior cleaning or polypropylene storage. They did find that because there were smokers that had this pipe. They found smoke. And also noticed an unusual odor emitting from the pipe bowl. Uh, likely the, re the result of a storage in a gun case that had oil in it. And the point of going through and having all that test is is the fear that every collector has is, and that's the fear of reproductions. Of right. People. We can age things now. Uh, we can duplicate this style. You know, dermal tools and yeah. machines. How and detrimental is that to not only to the collecting world, to the to the collectors, but also to the archaeological community as well. How detrimental is the production and sale of fake artifacts to what we do? There's uh, uh, my friend Floyd Ritter uh, over in Collinsville, Illinois, told me there's far, far more fakes in the world, reproduction, than there are real pieces. Right. Now let's talk about this culture that was around the pipe, the Hopewell. What would be the purpose of producing a pipe like this to the Hopewell culture? Why would they need a pipe like this? Um, to me, if you have a Hopewell, uh, I don't know what we want to call it, a settlement, a village, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's not what they would call it probably, but a Hopewell complex. Mm -hmm. They would have one great pipe, possibly, that the whole tribe could utilize. Maybe the shaman, the, the man that's a, a religious leader, somebody like that would be in charge of this pipe. And you would meet in the evening like we go and maybe have a beer and talk among ourselves, you know, whatever we're going to talk about, hunting, fishing, uh, whatever. And they would meet like this. And maybe they were talking about religious things. Maybe they were talking about hunting that uh, they did as a hobby, not that they had to, but I got a great big deer the other day. Did you see him? You know, that's what I think happened. Art, right, this is a fantastic piece. How, Thank you. What, what are the, uh, let's say, the, the, the ratio of platform pipes compared to effigy pipes compared to plain old regular pipes? What's, well, there's a lot more of them, yeah. but uh, this to me, and I haven't seen every pipe in Ohio or New York or wherever, but it's one of the largest Mm -hmm. platform pipes I've ever seen. I mean, they they are a little bit smaller. Yeah. Oh, without a this doubt. This is a big guy. Without a doubt. Here, let's put this guy yep. before we break the damn thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I have here is an assemblage of pipes that, uh, for them, I actually found at the Crib Mound mm -hmm. in that layer that we're talking about the Hopewell culture. Mm -hmm. And this one here is a snake effigy has a mouth and eyes. This one here is a little critter. And this one here is a graceful Hopewell monitor pipe. But this one I think is the one that we're zeroing in on. And uh, this one was found by me in the, in the uh, woodland period or the Hopewell period of the Crib Mountain. Oh, here's, a, here's, here's my question is, you know, you, we have all these people today that are saying how awful, how horrible it is. You know, when this was first you know how awful and horrible it is to go out and collect these artifacts in you know? the 50s let's say yeah and and yeah in the 50s and you know where were those people then I well guess what happened question. 
the University of Oklahoma. Why, well, my, why is it today that it's deemed so horrible and back in the 50s when it was happening, nobody seemed to care? Well, it's a period of understanding. It's a period, uh, you know, our at one time slavery was in vogue. Now it's horrible. Right. You know, so it, it, times change, people change, their thought process. The University of Oklahoma headed up by Greg Perino. He was an archaeologist from Illinois and very famous person, Greg Perino. Well, they came and they looked at the crib and they said, well, yes, we'd like to dig that mound, you know, scientifically. So an archaeological group came and said, well, yes, the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And they went to Mr. Roth, R-A-A-F, who owned the crib at that time, and they said, uh, Greg Perino said, here's our proposal. We would like to dig the crib and record everything and the artifacts to go to the University of Oklahoma or somebody, you know, I don't know who. And uh, he said, fine. But what happened, the farmers that had land down below the crib went to Mr. Roth and they said, if you tear that mound down, our lands will flood faster and more rapidly than if that uh, impediment wasn't there. Yeah, but that's crap because the river's going to go wherever the river's going to Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So they said, you have to rebuild that bank. And so Mr. Roth said, well, uh, I'm sorry, but I said, you can tear it down, but you got to build it back. And they said, we barely have funding to dig it. We sure can't put it back. So that deal fell through. So lack of Then IU came along with uh, Dr. Keller, did a report, you can buy that report, it's 1955 or something like that, did a report on the crib. And they said that we have dug enough shell heaps to know everything there is to know about a shell mound. We're not interested. So many people today look at people back in the 50s and 60s collecting artifacts with today's mindset, and they're like, oh, that's cruel, that's awful, that's evil, how dare you? And Whereas back in that period, the archaeological community had the opportunity to, to do it, and they said, we know everything there is to know. Then why dig something again? Why dig something again? And then you have the river on top of it that is literally washing it off the face of the earth, washing it down river out to and sea. And the floods come. Right. The flood, is coming. Feet to the, river. the flood is coming, it's going down. The flood is coming, and it's washing the artifacts away. So why... You know, this is stuff, this is history that is being lost. It seems to me that if anything, that people that went there and collected did more of a service to the prehistoric peoples that occupied that site for saving that culture so that we have something that we can learn, that we can study. They did more of a service to us modern people, to us indigenous people right. that are out there. I mean, if I was a Navajo out in Arizona, I would love to know about the people that came before me. It's like you said in the first interview you did. You saw that in the 1950s and 60s that Native cultures were, per, were, were perceived as ignorant. And if you watch some of the old Westerns, those peoples, you, that, it is horrible how they are The portrayed. reason I got into artifacts was in grade school, because I kept watching these movies, and the Cowboys always won. And I thought, these people are smart. How could they lose every battle and everything? And they didn't. Right. They were savvy. I mean, they were very smart. And we portrayed them as a secondary people. And they're every bit as equal as us. Right, Ex exactly. And the way to, and another way to show it is, is to show what isn't written down, what isn't recorded. To save the artifacts before they're washed in the Mississippi and gone forever. To show in stone, look, these are amazing pieces of absolutely incredible artwork that were made by Native cultures in prehistory. We're not destroying history, we're saving history. Right, and you cannot, that, that story cannot be told by sitting in the middle of a river. It can only be told where it's out where professional people, whether they be collectors or professional archaeologists, can examine it and study about it and take what we do know and combine it with what we see. And right. to me, that's what's important, you know. And you don't get that chance and opportunity in the bottom of the world because fact bar none, the worst crime, one of the worst crimes that ever happened in, in, hum, in the history of humanity was what happened when the Western world discovered North America. 
It was the pillage, plunder, and destruction of not only an entire continent in its peoples, but also the natural resources that that continent had, that the Western Hemisphere had. And their diseases, and these people weren't... Uh, and the diseases that came up. And it just seems to me that the greatest service that we can do as modern people is to try to tell the story of what was here before Anglo culture ever got here. I, I don't know, man. I guess, I guess I get some worked up and passionate about it because, you know... It's, well, you see uh, what's happening. It's my as we As we come to a non-digging, a uh, more restrictive society, get, we're, we're stifling our growth in, in intellect. Here's what frustrates me is, is because it's my generation that is inheriting a conflict that I didn't cause or create. You know, it is a conflict of... All right, this happened. Arche First off, the it is to me it is a crime that the archaeological, the professional archaeological world do not have the money, do not have the resources to excavate as much as needs to be excavated. All right, you have we have so much development going on. There are more sites destroyed by construction companies than have ever been destroyed by private individuals. And the fact that someone out there that walks along and is picking up an arrowhead is deemed as being this evil person when you have an entire construction company bulldozing down sites, ripping up the dirt, hauling the topsoil off, hauling the archaeological layers. Well, you have off. the best example of all where you live. Where we live. In right Sierra where you County. live. Right now is a shopping center. Right. What yep. was that shopping center before? There. At one time it was a great Mound. And there was an artifact that was discovered off that site. That's one of the greatest shell of ever. Orgets, you know, that has two humans clutched in combat, choking each other, was found off that site. All we have is that artifact. What do you think, you know, out of this conversation, out of, out of my rant, and I apologize for No, no. On, I'm loving your rant. <laughs> I, I do this work. I'm obsessed. I should be on medication. I should be on medication. But what... what out of all the different things that we discussed, if you wanted to kind of wrap it up and say one thing, what do you think would be is the most important thing that we discussed and something that maybe somebody out there is watching can take away from, from what we discussed? Preserve the past for the future. I think that says it all. In any way possible. I mean, just in any way possible. Preserve the past. Preserve the past so people in the future will have the benefit of knowing what we've collectively learned. Or is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap Maybe up? go home. <laughs> Art, thank you. I love you. I appreciate it very you much. Know, you know that. You know that. You know that. Great mutual. Shade. Mutual. How do you know where you're going unless you know where you've been? It's in studying and understanding the mistakes of the past. How do you know where you're going unless you've been? That's good. Never judge another man until you walk in his moccasin. That's right. Everyone is going through a situation that no one... That Here's my moccasins. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. We appreciate it.